Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 57, I think. I think that's the yeah. number. That is the number, 57 of the Titan Forge podcast. My name is Dratnus, joined by usual people, Tettles and Trell, and special not usual person, guest Squishy. Hello. I'm I'm on the upper row next to you. This is uh, Weird Fearling here. Yeah, this is a, a new place for you. Actually, it's not a new place for you. It's a different oh, place it? than you were the last time you were on the Titan Forge podcast, but it is the same time, the same place you were at from Titan Forge podcast episode thirty three. And the way I can tell that is because Tettles has reused the overlay exactly from <laughs> okay, okay. episode thirty three. So, <laughs> hear me out. Dranos <laughs> is flaming me for reusing the uh, the overlays from episode thirty three. Yet this guy, I put the episode overlays for episode fifty six in our. Uh, in our Google Drive folder, and for some reason, he just reused the overlays from uh, 55 two shows in a row, so for shame. I forgot, but you are you thought about this. You planned this. You, cho- you there, chose this. There was active thought put into this, yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyways, um, <laughs> well, welcome to our show, Squishy. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so this Glad week... To be back. <laughs> This week, we're going to talk uh, with you and each other, of course, about... Uh, we've got a number of topics. So, of course, we have Preach's interview with Ian Hezekostas, which uh, happened yesterday and was extremely, I think, informative. And there was some some new information revealed and maybe some insight into Blizzard's thought process. And hopefully, I think, I think Preach did a pretty good job of delivering a lot of the concerns of the player base in a, in a way that maybe got through to Ian a little bit. So... I think there's some hope there that we might be able to make some progress, although there's, of course, a great amount of uh, of worry about some some systems, too. Uh, so that we'll we'll talk all about that and we'll have all our takes on on those things. We also have Mythic Plus on Shadowlands. So Shadowlands has gone into beta. Mythic Plus is out. Uh, we've got four dungeons available for Mythic Plus, and we'll talk a little bit about all of them. Of course, that's you know it's it's very much in beta state, so we're not. We're not going to come out with like a this dungeon sucks, this dungeon's great type thing yet, or like this is this is awful or not. But we'll talk about the things that are currently problems and the uh... people also aren't uh, playing the dungeons with the fixes, so it's sometimes it's hard to tell what can and will be problematic going into the future. But there are general trends that people I think have gotten pretty decent identifying too. Yeah, I just like looking at the scaling stuff. Like you can tell what's going to get out of hand. I think when we tested a Talazar a couple of years ago in beta, we were like, these Sarge are going to one-shot at some point in the expansion. And sure enough, by season two, they one-shot. <laughs> no, no, they don't one-shot, dude. You just take them onto the ledge. <laughs> True. Well, yeah, that, that's why we tank them there, though, you know. Yeah, nothing in these dungeons one-shots. You just Venthyr past them. I don't understand. Um, <laughs> that... Venthyr past them. Night Fae past them. <laughs> yeah, or, cool, so. or you just uh, Necrolord armor shield to survive the one-shot. Yeah, okay. Um, then we're, our main topic this week that's kind of not current eventsy but more evergreen is going to be a discussion of the process of like learning a dungeon that you haven't learned before you haven't seen before you know how to deal with these dungeons when you're playing them for the first time because that is something that all of us are going to experience either now in beta or also just when this thing goes live and we're going to be playing dungeons we haven't played before and you know if you look back at how we played BFA dungeons in season one there was so much, you know, learning initially, and then since then, there's been continued learning as well. And the more ahead of that curve you are, the better you're going to do, really all through the expansion. Because even up till now, there's still that kind of stuff being discovered, and it's still a process. But yeah, there are general optimizations that are always going to be made in terms of just like what mobs are you pulling or what pathing you're going to be making. Uh, but there will always be some pretty sweeping things that will occur across the whole entire dungeon and like across the whole expansion. Double matron pulling under rot, you know. I don't think that shit's ever been pulled, nor do I think that shit will be pulled uh, two expansions from now. Double so. reanimated honor guard. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's cool. weird. Tell us because I remember you pulling the double matron pack and then also the matron patrol in the charity event we did last week. So we had three matrons in one. <laughs> did you notice how we just full wiped on that shit in a fifteen? So yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> So there's some other good clips. I wonder if we have the other clip. Actually, we probably do as clip of the week, huh? No, it's not I haven't looked at it. Week, okay. Yeah. Well, there is a fantastic clip you can find of Tettles just typhooning and sending a maggot into the stratosphere, just right on up out of the ceiling of the dungeon. Um, so that's a that's a good one to go find on on the channel. Anyways, uh, before we get to those main topics, we've got a little bit of, of housekeeping and stuff. One thing that Tettles and I have announced recently since our last episode 
is that next week we will be doing a event for the entire week pretty much called Push Week Extravaganza where we will be watching the top teams from around the world do Live Mythic Plus and commentating together. This is something we've been really excited about. We've been working on getting this thing put together for quite a long time actually. And so we're going to have like an overlay. We're going to have both of our webcams, both of our audio on both of our streams for 14 hours a day is the plan. Um, and <laughs> that we've got... Please don't roll your eyes like that. <laughs> we've got um, all the top teams basically have either agreed to do this or there are teams that we haven't asked yet. But we've pretty much asked everybody. We've got the top two Chinese teams, uh, the top Korean team. We've got a bunch of teams from EU and NA. We've got pretty much everybody that either is playing or might be playing. Uh, to agree to let us like restream their their stream and put it on our our coverage here when they're doing interesting stuff. So uh, we're really excited about doing this. This is going to be really fun. We're still going to do our show next week. We'll break this event in some way to do our show as well. So Titan Forge Podcast will go on next weekend is the plan, uh, but it'll probably be followed. We'll probably we do not I, know how it's going to be structured yet. It's a, that's a TBD on our end. I think. Yeah, we'll, we'll try. I mean, we should be able to do it at regular Titan Forge time is the plan. Um, but stay tuned. We'll, we'll, of course, keep you updated. And I think we're also looking for some helpers. We're, we haven't quite made this announcement yet, but uh, we are going to need some people to help us scout ahead and, and figure out which streams we're supposed to look at at any given time. So uh, if you're going to be around, if you're going to be watching this event and you're interested in taking on that kind of role, we'll, we'll have probably details and we'll probably run it through our Titan Forge podcast Discord as well. We'll have uh, people you know, looking at the the streams from the various teams that are competing and giving us an idea of like, hey, this team just started at 30, you know, maybe we need to go watch them. Yeah. Uh, so that is our plan for next week. Of course, next week is push week. It is not the best week on the calendar, but it is the second best by most estimates, certainly top three. Uh, and it is Sanguine Quaking Fortified. And it is a very good week for Mythic Plus. So everybody is pretty much going to be doing Mythic Plus all week that we know that does Mythic Plus, like Trial, for instance. Um, it's going to be gaming all week, right? Yep. Uh, I think some people are going to have to decide between splitting their time between beta and live, but I imagine most most Mythic Plusers are going to be on live next week. And then Tyrannical Weeks are going to kind of become the beta weeks and the <laughs> Fortified Weeks you play live. Uh, as they were in Legion as well. Yeah, that's how I, how I imagine this going. So uh, it's going to be really exciting. Should be a lot of fun. All right. Uh, let's move on to the next part of our show where we get to thank our supporters over Patreon.com. But I was just talking for the past three minutes. So, Tattles, do you want to read our patrons out today? Go yeah, little sure. change pace? I'll, 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 be, I'll do this, I guess. All right. Uh, Paul of U.S. Proudmore, Ahar of U.S. Proudmore, Anastasia of U.S. Proudmore, King of Skills, Zuku, Ja, a Drunk Sweet from Legion of Lennings, Argentani U, I Wish I Was Dratnos' Dino Pillow, Heltari, Blue of Emerald Dream, Chrome, Seraphicus, Trekkie, The Marsh Hare, Regulus, uh, Meaningful Choice. <laughs> Chuny, <laughs> Shadowlands systems have so many layers, even comparing character sims is no longer meaningful. It, comparing character sims is never meaningful. Uh, Coke Dogs Gopher, Rude Dinosaur, My Covenant Choice Defines My Personality. Okay. Uh, give Enhancement Shaman's Shroud of the Elephant. <laughs> What is Shroud of the Elements? It's probably Shroud of Concealment. Oh, okay. All right. That makes sense. But the but the shitty watered-down totem version that's not movable. <laughs> Dude, yeah. It's just a totem. Just a Shroud totem that's like a 20-yard range around it. <laughs> oh, man. That's like... So I, I, I can really see them doing that. We did it. We fixed this Shaman. Is, this fits the class fantasy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. T tater Tot. Windwalker Teal Tears Fuel Wind Fury Crits. Honestly, at this point... We should all just be BM Hunters, a Prot Warrior, and a freaking Mistweaver Monk. It's that, it's that MDI shit. Uh, Sin of US Kill Jaden, Daz Boot, Better Mage Lead Than Tal. Brought to you by Dratnos the Excel Wizard, Brad Ceratops. That Resto Druid with Focusing Iris just out DPS'd me. Time to reroll Hunter. That is a Moonkin main. I'm so sorry. Uh, Gino, <laughs> 51st best Demon Hunter on Thrall US from the Guild Overslept. Congratulations, Gino. You were previously the 61st. Uh, Necris, Revdil, Shadow Priest can pump. If you chain pull, just give them the chance. No. Riley, <laughs> Neva, Holly Stud, my guild won't rename to Triangle. Flick, Evie, Frosty K, New Meta, also nope. Uh, Gino is still not 3100 and needs to get good. <laughs> 
<laughs> Jesus. Uh, at least they aren't destroying conduits. I think they've changed conduits at least. Yeah, so. they've said it's not going live with the current destructible form, which we'll talk about, but yeah. Pog. Uh, take Light of the Protector and Enrage Regen off the GCD. 100% agreed. Agreed. Whoa, Bonesy, no verse, Gallic, and no trick. So big shout out to all of those guys. Thank you so much. In defense of Gino, I ran a freehold 22, I think, with him the other day, and he did just fine. So, But he's not 3,100 IO. Wait, that's wait. Gino is the 51st best DH on Thrall US, right? Is that what we were talking yeah. about? Oh, wait, there's two different Gino. Okay. There's two different people that have Gino as their, uh, in their message here. I see. Gino themselves and uh, and somebody flaming them. That is what you love to see. <laughs> yes. that, that is exactly what happened. Tettle just yep. released an article on improving your I.O. If you want to go check that out. He has gotten great remarks about it. Oh, yeah. This, this is this is a great storyline. Uh, let's, okay. let's go take a look at this. Okay. So this this article is sick. So uh, I, I, I've gotten the most shit for this article, but the article on WoWhead is titled How to Improve Your Mythic Plus Raider I.O. Score. And it's basically the dungeon version of how to improve your Warcraft Logs All-Star Points. And fundamentally, the dungeon can get broken down into... Uh, how do you do the highest level of dungeons for yourself? But I have gotten the most shit. That article has 144 comments, and I've never seen an article with that many comments. It's less than 10 hours old, and it has 144 comments. It is. I mean, NA just barely woke up. I mean, it's probably gonna have like 300 by the end of the day. I, I woke Somebody up. said an absolute flood of positivity. God, people love me, and people definitely do not blame me for the toxicity that is Raider IO score in that in the comments. <laughs> I woke up five hours after that went live. It had a hundred comments. <laughs> People what are very I... passionate about Raider AO score, okay? Yeah, this is a wild article. Okay, a so wild for article. what it's worth, people uh, did not like the part of the article where I explained that if you are very adamant on using LFG, you should really consider playing something that's more meta. They, they were very upset about that part of the article and continue to link it to me. Yep, that's, um, that, that is one extremely unpopular thing to say. It's interesting as well, you'll find similar people who both have the position that the Covenant system that Blizzard has put forward is going to be great, and also that they do not want to get declined for those sorts of things. And you can kind of see that, that that's just two two cars on a collision course with each other in Shadowlands here, because that, that is very much something that could become a problem very easily. All right, so speaking of Shadowlands, speaking of complaints about Shadowlands... And really, we're not we're not going to try and keep this too negative because the more I, the more I think about Shadowlands, the more it's just like ninety percent incredible features. And even the Covenant system, like the Covenant abilities themselves, are so sweet. It's such a cool thing. Oh yes, I agree. just we just got to get them off of the uh, the power level, you know, being permanently so associated with your Covenant choice thing, and the expansion is going to own. That is all we got to do. We, we're we are one thing away, and that is we're, far closer. The three yard line and need a touchdown to win. <laughs> I saw that. That was a tweet from uh, Fired Those Up. Series of tweets oh, were was, good. There was like a, it was like a. We are the Seahawks, and we are at the three yard line. And for some reason, we like to pass the ball rather than using Marshawn Lynch or something <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah, that, I, I think Fired Up had a tweet that then started going into other sports references instead. It was a good tweet. Um, but anyways, yeah, so Preach did an interview with Ian Hasekosis, and this was a fantastic interview that you should absolutely... It, it was more of a discussion than like a, a super structured interview, but there was a lot of good moments in there, and it was, I think, very interesting to watch. Uh, let's see, where do we want to start off with here? How about, I guess, let's let's talk with our, our guest Squishy about this. Um because I think last time we talked to you, the Covenant Choice thing was was a topic of discussion. Um, and at that point, let's see. You kind of accepted that Covenants were not going to be swappable, is what Tettles has written in our show notes here. So is that still your position, or was that ever? Or is Tettles wrong entirely so in our show notes here? Previously, I, I, like, I was like, these need to be swappable. That, like, I, I think the position everybody else has. I think I've accepted the fate of Covenants at this point. Uh, just to not get my hopes up, because I think JB had a tweet that was very similar, like, I've kind of accepted this and I'll make it work. But if they do change it, like, I think I think they are losing something, but for the people who are playing optimally, it, it, they will get to enjoy the way that they want to play. So it's kind of like, I'm kind of at a very neutral spot now, because I can see why Blizzard wants to do it on one hand, but on the other hand, me wanting to be optimal, or anyone being trying to be optimal, these these, these are two opposing philosophies that are just clashing in the middle and that's kind of what the discussion came out of the preach situation 
Yeah, from my perspective, yeah. we might just I might just get lucky. Like I might just be playing a class where the same covenant is good for all three of my specs and in both Raid and Mythic Plus, in which case I'm gonna be so happy, I'm gonna have such a great time with this, but that could go from being like a 10% chance to being in a 100% chance uh, with, a, with a simple design paradigm shift. Yeah, and, and t- typically, I think the, the point that Preach was mostly trying to make is that there will be a fundamental discrepancy on how you are able to determine what your BIS is, overarching so many different levels of content that is just beyond the scope of just raid. Just, like, even raid to raid encounters, like one encounter to, the, to another encounter, uh, it's so challenging to ignore my cat hitting my camera it is, it is what it is man he does this shit all the time uh it's it's very hard to be able to even balance them between raid encounters much less uh across multiple aspects of the game so you do actually have to fully commit into what you believe is going to be your core like what you want to do at your core and then you have to pick what you want to do as like a secondary option a lot of the times i i think for me it's They've said they have a ripcord that they can pull it whenever they want. Yeah. I almost think they've shot themselves in the foot by saying that they have that because now there's going to be a lot of people are not going to have this real good discussion of let's try to make this work. Let's find a spot in the middle. It's just make come to swappable, make come to swappable, make come to swappable, pull that fucking ripcord. Whereas I think there's a way for them to try to meet in the middle and and then if that still doesn't work and like try try it out at least for like a little bit and if by mythic week it's still not working they could pull that ripcord but i feel like now a lot of people aren't even willing to give it a shot um okay so something that was said in like specifically in the interview with preach ian equated the uh covenants to something like like the beginning of Legion with the AP grind where you had to specifically pick which weapon you put your AP in. And then in addition to that, which spec you had to be to be able to get covenants because or, uh, legendaries because there was bad luck protection on your legendaries. So you had to make a very uh, decisive decision on what spec you were going to be and what spec you were going to be playing all the way up until Nighthold. And he said that it was not going to be that impactful. So that is promising at least. Sure hope not, yeah. My my thing was so especially when I talked about this yesterday, trying to like figure out why a lot of the player base doesn't like it. Like I don't like the not swapping things. I was trying to put it into words. So my take on it is I think they're trying to make it like picking a class. And when you pick a or picking a race, I mean when you pick a race, you have like a like a one percent damage or healing throughput type ability, like a very small variance and like a, a certain active ability, right? I think picking a covenant is way more impactful. Like currently on beta, there's like a it's like 15% damage or healing uh, sways in either direction of what covenant you pick and also active abilities and all kinds of unique soul binds within those covenants. And it's really, really hard to imagine a balanced world where uh, Blizzard gets it like exactly right and you can pick whatever covenant you want and still be successful in every branch of content. Like, I don't think that's even possible. Well, they backpedaled on something like that for Azerite. Do you remember Azerite at the beginning? They, they said specifically that they wanted generics for Azerite to be the... Uh, like what you picked if you were planning on playing multiple specs and that the generics were going to be the the best option for you if you were a multi-spec player. Whereas now, if you play multiple specs, like not even swapping from, not even like the hybrids, like not even swapping from Moonkin to Resto or Moonkin to Guardian or something like that, but literally even the pure DPS swapping between the three pure uh, specs that those uh, DPS classes get, there are some very interesting interactions with a lot of their abilities too that is like going to make some above and beyond going to be the best choice. And and I also hate how they kind of buff and nerf stuff via hotfix kind of on a whim uh, randomly. Can Okay, so think about Echoing Void. They kind of just gutted Echoing Void in the middle of the patch here for the current BFA patch. Whenever people already had a substantial amount of Echoing Void, but now you are in what is effectively a permanent decision, uh, and yeah, like, or, or when they, like yeah, the permanent exactly. decision of having cleansed your Void Ritual when they then came in and doubled its effectiveness. <laughs> oh, man, yeah, that's yeah. so just... I cleansed my weapon, and that weapon would have been a huge damage increase after the 100% damage buff to yeah. it. Yeah. Like, so, I'm following on that, I spent like 5 million gold on Corruption early, early in this patch. I spent all of my gold on Corruption. And I was like, you know, it's best right now. Hopefully they don't nerf it to be bad enough where I can't use it. And sure enough, they nerfed it to like the very bottom. Like I couldn't use Echoing Void after the nerf, even though I spent so much gold on it. And in the interview, Ian said, they like stuff that's overpowered. 
to like still be the best, but they want to nerf it down to a level where it's just barely the best, you know? And like, that's not historically how it's been. And so that worries me quite a bit about Covenants and Soulbinds. I, I think there's a lot of concerns about the Covenants, and that's why people are so scared. They want they want their to Covenants to be swappable for that safety net of if Blizzard tunes things the wrong way, overtunes things, undertunes things, or anything like that, they feel like they're missing out. Or the concern that they're missing out on this big ability that allows for the skip in Mythic Plus, or completely cheeses this raid ability, or they're just flat out missing out on like a really cool, you know, there was the Venthyr party or the boss rush for Kiri, and like, there's just a lot of, I think people are just really concerned and have all these different pieces that are so worrying that it people won't know until it's live, and I think that's a completely fair take. Yeah, I mean, there, I think there are so many great comparisons with those previous systems, like like with the Legion Artifacts. But the thing with the Legion Artifacts was, eventually you actually could put Artifact Power into two of them, and eventually you could then play two specs, you know, several months into Legion, at least. That's not going to be true with Covenants, right? With Covenants, you you will never be able to do, be in a position where you can play two different Covenants in the same week without it being, like, a serious chore to do that or not repeatable more than once or twice. Um, yeah. I mean, with, dude, yeah, like... Say you want to raid on Tuesday and do Mythic Plus on Thursday. Yeah. Man, do you want to really grind? <laughs> do you really want to grind all that effort into being uh, more optimal for Mythic Plus just so you can show back up on raid on Tuesday and be again optimal for raid? And it's, I don't know. I feel like there's just, or, or even Arena. Like, say you want to do all three, fuck. <laughs> and you're going to, you're going to take a significant survivability decrease because you're not Necrolord, so you don't have that shield. No, hell no. You're going to have to be Necrolord the whole entire time, but are you going to sabotage the raid for it? I don't know, maybe. Yeah, I mean, you're just going to have to pick whether or not you want to play seriously in Arenas, Mythic Plus, or Raid at any given time. And you can switch, like, after Raid progression, you can switch your Covenant or whatever, probably. You can do that kind of one-time switch and just be, like, slightly worse in farm, and that's probably not a big deal, but, like... Yeah, exactly. It, okay, where's the choice yeah. in that, right? Where, where are you making an actual choice there? It's kind of a forced move, right? And Yeah, you're just kind of stuck, rather. This cool decision about which covenant do you want to pick for aesthetic reasons isn't one that has ever really crossed your mind, right? You, you never were making that decision. That The game was rigged from the start, right? Um, like, well, the Azerite, like, like the Azerite situation, right? Like, what if you had to lock in your Azerite choice and you, did, you couldn't just drop two pieces of the same Azerite armor, right? And you were just locked into that one in that slot forever. And you, you, you know, that was... That was going to be the one you used. Uh, is, is or if reforging made you like take off that piece of Azerite armor, you had to like reforge your slot to be able to swap it out. Yeah, I, I, my favorite thing is the corruption example. It's like, imagine if you you only could do like echoing, like you, you had locked in whether or not you could even drop echoing void or use it at all, but not even at the start of eight point three. Back in eight point zero, the choice you made in eight point zero, because I guarantee you, when patch nine point one comes out, there's going to be stuff that's tied to which covenant you picked, right? And you're just you're locking yourself into that decision now, and that is going to be carrying forward for the rest of the expansion, right? You you just you know the new system comes out in nine point one, and something that you didn't even think about when you made that choice, something that you weren't even aware of and couldn't have possibly been aware of, is now a power level thing that's affecting you based on this choice you made. So, so this is like this is like a purely higher higher like in player approach, but I have like pretty bad player apathy whenever I don't have something that's like of great benefit that i see other people have i even get it with like oh yeah dispels in dungeons and, and like it, it gets down to like that level of bullshit like if i'm missing a pretty important dispel in dungeons sometimes you don't even want to zone into that dungeon because you know that your comp is like bad or like shadow of zul if you didn't have a demon hunter i don't even want to zone into kr man like there's no point of even attempting the dungeon like that's the level that i will get to too with covenants if i feel like i am that far behind on a character. Did, did like, you ever play like in Legion for the first six months with a character without Abyss Legendary? And you just, you see somebody <laughs> playing with Abyss Legendary and you're just like, man. Yes. Emerald and Dream Catcher yeah. was 11% damage gain. And I played with two damage legendaries that were like four to 5% damage gains a piece. And I was like, motherfucker, I'm 10% behind like literally Abyss Legendaries. And I have no way of being able to grind these out. What is yeah, this there's, there's nothing you could do. Yeah. You're like hard capped. And so the same here, thing as Covenants. Like you can't just swap randomly. There is, yeah, you can pick one area where you can be caught up, but then don't, like, do people really not want to be able to be good at Mythic Plus and Raid at the same time? Is that is that a choice that is going to be fun to decide like it's not like we're gaining something new relative to where we are right now, right? It's we're gonna have to choose something that we currently have to lose rather than something okay. that we don't yeah. have to gain. 
So for me, if it was if I was just picking it for a full raid encounter or like a full like raid instance, I would be fine. Or yeah. if I was just picking it for Mythic Plus, like all of the dungeons, I mm -hmm. would also be okay. But say I want to play multiple specs ever, or I want to swap between PvP, Mythic Plus, or Raid ever, then the the decisions that I have to make are all very challenging to make. And I think that the decisions should be made on like a Okay, so say they did make me lock in a decision for that whole entire raid encounter, I would almost be okay with that. But yeah. yeah. Well, you would just pick whatever's good for the last boss, right? Or the hard boss, and you know, you're right. That's fine. That's probably middling. That's better. Like that mm. is above average for all fights. That can be good in some situations. That, but most of the time, it's going to be good. I think this is something that they've been trying to do since Lee, uh, this expansion. With the whole Azerite reforging thing, they, he, he brought that up. Like, they, they've said why Azerite... People have asked for a very long time why Azerite reforging is the way it is. Like, multiple times since 8.0, even? Maybe yeah. 8.1? But they constantly gave the idea of, if, when you're specialized to something, like, you should be better at it. And that's always the answer that they've given. And I don't think... Myself included, I don't think a lot of people have really agreed with that, but that's that's kind of what they've been going with, and they've tried to do. It didn't work in BFA, so maybe they're just trying it again, because people just got around the semi-permanence of Azerite armor, but I don't think that's a great idea to take. Some of their design philosophies I can understand. That one's just weird to me, I think. Yeah, the thing to me is that like it seems like from the the material they're putting out that the covenant choice is supposed to be this decision about like what army you're joining and has you know serious impact on the war and you know permanent impact on your character and the state of the world and that is entirely lost by tying it to power level right by tying it to power level not just high-end players but everybody who's interested in getting invited to groups in the group finder with any degree of reliability is going to no longer be making a decision about like which of these covenants you know speaks to me aesthetically which of these covenants do i want to support and also the decision can't be permanent, right? Because they have to let you swap if there's power level associated with it, even if it's costly, right? Like if you just decoupled this from power level, then we could actually make the choice fully permanent, right? If you were like, you could just make it so that, yeah, that's, you know, that's a choice you made. That is an actual impactful choice you've made. This is going to have permanent effects on your character. It could have permanent effects on the world as well. You know, it could, your character could just have zones be different because of the covenant you made. It could be entirely massive lore implications and ramifications on the world. And all of that, what the covenant system could be in that way is entirely, it's not just watered down, but that element of the covenants is gone for me entirely because of the fact that it's tied to power level. Well, dude, also Asmongold put out a straw poll that had, I don't even remember, it was some obscene number of responses. And it was like, are you going to decide covenants based on lore aesthetics? Uh, like mounts, RPG elements, blah, 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 blah. Or are you going to pick pick it based on what the other top players are picking? And 55% of his audience, which I would say is, a more casual audience than definitely even ours. 55% of his audience oh, said 100%. They, they were going to pick based off of what uh, the other top end players are going to pick. And if and if his audience is saying that, then that's a better representation of like, oh, fuck, this is a probably a pretty big dilemma. Yeah, I mean, it, it could still be a minority of players, but it's not this like, oh, the top 1% of the top 1% of players are the people that are, you know, actually going to care about this. It's It's not... It's not that small of a, like, there, there are a very small amount of players pushing for world first or whatever, where you probably actually need to be the right covenant to, to win. But there's a huge amount of players who don't want to just throw away five or 10% of their character's power level for an aesthetic choice. You know, there, there's a huge amount of players that will not see a choice based on its aesthetics if there is that much power level tied to it. So, yeah. Um, and there's a huge amount I, of players that like, just, yeah. Sorry about it. I, I feel like Blizzard thinks that that amount of players that is going to, copy what the top players are doing is still under 10 percent, and, and i think they're extremely wrong and it's like 60 to 80 percent of players rather play what's best well than the aesthetic choice it depends on what you that. mean by players because there's like if you actually look at the numbers there's like a huge percentage of players that just never hit max level um in any given expansion or like never have done higher than a plus three key so like that that section of the community yeah okay, probably that's true. probably is entirely like, like, engaged in any level of max level content though yeah, yeah right yeah. players that play the game consistently like let's say like expansion. ahead of the curve players or whatever that that population uh absolutely yeah i, I uh, think there's this focus this big focus around from blizzard around i can do something that somebody else can't i feel good when that moment happens and i think that that's a perfectly fair like statement to say cuz when you can do somebody else can't it's it's it feels good the problem, I think, and why a lot of people are having the feeling that they are and their concerns is when you don't have those things, you feel bad. 
And that feeling of not of not being able to do something probably outweighs the or you remember the times you feel bad more than you feel good about something. Like Tettles was saying, when you don't have the legendary that makes you do ten percent damage, you feel really bad. May I mean, but. You know, if he did get that, he would feel good, but which do, which would he remember more? And it's probably the time that you felt like you were letting your group down. Yeah, and the thing is, there there can still be that feeling of, like, I made a good choice here. Like, you know, there, with mages right now, for instance, you know, I made a good choice to play Minute Mage on this fight. I made a good choice to, like, you know, do all these things and, like, have these corruptions and, and stuff on my gear. But, like, you weren't, it, it wasn't a choice you locked yourself into with your Covenant pick, right? The other person could have made that choice as well. They weren't barred off from having it and just you made a better choice right that's it's like yeah. with the legendaries thing like forgeable legendaries are going to be a great example of this like if you build the right legendary and you make a good decision there you're you're going to be so happy you're going to be like yeah well, I, I picked an awesome legendary for this fight and i made a really smart decision legendaries are are like a fine choice because you are able to forge more in the future if you're mis if right. you do end up having a mistake and like well, ultimately, you have that decision to be able to forge a different legendary over and over again and getting more and more as you do Torghast and as you gear up and stuff like that. And Covenants could be like that too. Like the second Covenant ability you unlock could be like a, a more of a grind than the first and the third could be more than the second and the first to like get you access to those second Covenants. I'd be fine with I'm that. I'm fine with that. Yeah, yeah. shit. <laughs> and I'm fine with, you know, like with Essences, for instance, you know, Nobody would be happy if they could only play one essence on their character, right? If they were, if they literally just had to pick one major essence and only use that, except for a couple of specs which get lucky, or a couple of classes which get lucky. But besides those classes which get lucky, which there will be in Shadowlands as well, that's going to be a really good choice to play if you want to play both Raid and Mythic Plus. You, the, you, the, pick, the spec to pick is not actually going to be like what spec is best at either of these things. It's going to be what spec has the same best covenant for both of those things. So yeah. be on the lookout for that information. But uh, right. that aside, it, it's going to be it, like it's just this case of you, you know. I, I, I lost my chain with the right thought. Go ahead, Tuttles. Anyways, uh, <laughs> but before we move on, Conduit Destruction, uh, they did they did briefly talk about Conduit Destruction at the very end of the Preach interview. They said that they were going to look to backtrack on that and that they realized that that was only going to lead to more and more problems than it would end up solving things. Yeah. <laughs> I, that's a great, great decision. Consider Okay, consider the case of you're a character with different BIS covenants, but the same BIS conduit within each covenant for all your specs. Consider how awful that would have been because you would have just been swapping, like you, you would have had to pick, you would have to hard commit to just one spec basically, uh, and you couldn't even swap. But then cons compare how different that would have been to a, a spec, a class that had the same BIS, or the, diff the same BIS covenant, but different BIS soulbind trees, and then you could have just permanently had the, th the right things socketed into each. I, I know a bunch of people are really happy about this, but Ian said that they're getting rid of Condestructibility the way it is, but they're still planning on keeping the semi-permanents of it. So you won't be able to swap between dungeons to dungeons and raid bosses to raid bosses. They just don't want you to have the feeling of, I'm going to go grind more conduits so I can get around the swapping. I guess it because, depends on what semi-permanence is going to mean in this in this case, right? I mean, that, that that's exactly what it means. But I know a lot of people are happy, but I have a feeling that it's not going to be exactly what they want because they're still trying to limit this to not be a micro choice. It literally they're, could they're, not. It could not be worse than the destructibility part, part though. Don't say that. <laughs> they, yeah, they could come up with something very, that's worse. Very, it would be very challenging. Becoming a worse more, system. Exponentially worse. increasing anima costs to swap your covenants <laughs> or your Shut conduits. Up right now. As well as destroying them. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, to, to discourage players from destroying conduits, we fix the system by making it so that it costs them something to do it each time so they won't accidentally do it too much. Um, <laughs> That's never thing. been a problem before. I don't I, know what you're talking about. I would actually be kind of okay with locking in a permanent conduit and covenant layout for a given spec for a given type of content, right? Like, I'd be actually kind of, I'd be kind of fine locking in, like, okay, for my fire spec in Mythic Plus, you know, I'm going to make some permanent choices about my conduits and my co covenants and my soul binds and stuff. But the on problem a lockout or like a per like a permanent. I would permanent even be lockout. fine with it. Maybe on a patch basis, because of course, when a new patch comes out and changes everything, you're going to feel dumb for <laughs> playing whatever gets nerfed. I, I'd even buff. say like a month, like yeah, a like month a month. I, I, yeah, I, 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 I get down with once a month. Yeah, I, I feel like I feel like that's a, a semi permanent decision. The, the the problem for me comes with when these choices are just attached to all to, to all sorts of content and you're just in this position where you need to make the best choice for one kind of content and you are then screwed in the others okay yeah so <laughs> there was a good sign though on the conduit destructibility front i think that there is nice at least that they backed off of one bad system but of course they haven't committed to any system on it so could, they could still come up with another bad one and the core 
at the heart of the covenant system, there is still that thing that I think all of all of us are really apprehensive about. Um, and for me, I think the play pattern for me is just going to be, I'm just not going to be doing Mythic Plus when it's raid progression time, and I'm not going to be doing... I'm not going to be having much fun in raid when I'm in my Mythic Plus stuff after raid progression's over. And that's, like... I'll still play the game and stuff. I'll still do that, but that that is going to be the world that I'll be living in if they if the covenants go live like it is now. And you know, I'm somewhat come to terms with that because it seems likely that they're not going to budge. But I hope they do. I, it, se- it seems like they're trying to be receptive here. So uh, I, I don't think you're going to see it go all the way. I think there's a way that if the community s- tries to work with them, they they the community and and the devs can find a middle ground. I think that, I think them- that a nice middle ground would be much appreciated at this point i i don't need them to get all the way there to where it's like fully interchangeable like talents or like spec or like whatever right i i definitely need them to meet somewhere in the middle yeah because f- feedback right now of make conduit swappable or make make covenant swappable they've heard it they know they have the community's opinion on it but i think trying to suggest things and explain why you are so upset or concerned about the system goes so much further and may actually help them come to a compromise that will make everybody happier yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with that. There should definitely be a compromise here where I don't get everything I want about this. But if, as long as I'm allowed to both play Mythic Plus and play Raid and play multiple and specs of the same character yeah. and, and not just feel awful about it, then that that's the game I want to play. So I hope they let me. I hope because for me, the thing about WoW that's been so great since Legion really has just been the fact that there is Mythic Plus and Raid to do, and that. Like I, I love both of those forms of content, and I would I love both of them because I can feel optimal in both of them, and I can feel like I'm doing the best I can, and I'm improving, and uh, I'm you know coming up with cool strategies, and I see somebody else do something cool, and I can be like, oh okay, I'm gonna start doing that as well, and I'd hate to be in this position where I just I see somebody else doing something cool, and I'm like, well, I cannot do that because I'm in a raiding guild, and I need to stay in my raid con- covenant, so. Well, I can spend hundreds of hours and gear up another identical character and choose the other covenant, or I can just be so far. But I think, okay, well, that comes with its own dilemma of like, am I going to ask my fucking guild to actually gear my Mythic Plus character? Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, I no, mean, no I, guild wants to do that because that's the thing, right? P- people say, people say, oh, just have another, have another rogue or whatever. But like, in the the point of this is that you're trying to overcome like a ten percent differential in whatever content you're doing. So in order for it to actually be the right move to have another character, you need to have the means to get it gear wise within ten percent of your main character, and that is not easy to do. And for very few players, is it fun to do? For very few players, are you going to have fun the gearing up class? the same class? Like, okay, if it's a if it's a different class, I can kind of get down yeah. with it. Well, but that... if it's the same class, bro, you got like what the hell? And that's that's why that's why this kind of the core of the argument to me that Blizzard is making is so flawed because you know with classes and with classes being a permanent choice that you make at least if you if you're like if you see some warlock doing something cool you're like oh cool I want to play a warlock and you roll up a warlock that is really fun to to play a new character right and to, to switch over to warlock if you want to and you're just like this is you know this is awesome but you don't have that ability with covenants because it's 95% of your buttons are the same right you're just you're you'd be leveling up a new character that is functionally identical except for that that one difference and so you don't get that whole like the the justification for the things being different power level because they have hugely different play styles and stuff as well it doesn't exist yeah on, on the idea that like they realize that conduit destruction of 70 permanents people just get around that via paying paying a cost or you know farm grinding more couldn't you technically get like you can technically get around the covenant 70 permanents by either rolling a new character or just doing the quest so if they see that conduits are a problem, do they not see that covenants are going to be a problem? Because people are like, if if they see, if the community sees that this is so big, that Venthyr is so far ahead, they're going to get around that semi-permanence, either by straight up re-rolling, like if you find out early, or just changing your covenant. So I'm not sure what, what they're going for here. Maybe they will realize that and they just is don't it- have a solution either. Do you think it's a okay? Do you think that the current state of how in-game functionality works in World of Warcraft, with how people are actually actively playing this game, do you think that this is an okay stance to take? Because obviously, if we go back a longer periods of time, uh, maybe in like a past life in BC with Alder and Scryer, or even in Classic where there were more permanent decisions made in terms yeah, of there was the elements. the Gelkis versus the Magram Centaur and Desolus, of course. Do you remember that one, Tettles? No. <laughs> I don't know what that means. There was, it was like it was the the OG Scryers versus Aldor with nothing important tied to it at all. 
but yeah no so it's like it, there's there's always been stuff like that and i think if you're playing like a very older version of the game i think people would be more receptive to it but i feel like the the current version of the game is so end game content focused very minimally is it like leveling rpg elements uh other aspects of the game focused yeah I mean, I think RPG I, elements are sweet. I I, I I love RPGs. I think the RPG elements are dope, but like, but like they're even, dope in the context of also tied into in-game shit. Even if you look at like actual like RPG RPGs, like The Witcher is a good example of this. I saw a great tweet chain about this earlier today. I forget from whom or from who, but it was, you know, in The Witcher, you, your actual permanent choice skill tree or whatever that affects your character's power level, you can swap that. You can you can get go buy something that lets you change that, you know, fully. And the only permanent choices are the ones that like affect the world, you know, affect the story, but they're not the ones that actually affect your character's power level. Um, and in those, in those, you know, RPGs with with choices and stuff, those are games where you like make a choice maybe every hour or whatever, and it's a really cool choice. How many of those games are the, are ones where you make a choice in the first like ten hours of playtime, and then in the following two years of game time when you play that same game, you don't actually make any more choices. You're just affected by that choice you made at hour ten of the expansion because that's what Shadowlands is going to be like. That's not. That is not the same itch that a, you know an actual choice based RPG or whatever scratches. Okay. I think we can all agree that that was an amazing interview by Preach and Ian, mm -hmm. and we're really glad that Ian even accepted yeah. to do that. He tweeted about it and he was like, you know, the fact that only one fail clip came out of this is a good sign. I did a pretty good job, I think. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. I mean, it wasn't even a fail clip. It was just Franck adding the 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 clown ending to like Ian has very lengthy response about do you believe that the only something about hunters and their button presses and, and then preach goes i don't see why not well yeah. i think the thing that ian's miss so that was there's this clip of ian talking about how they don't want it to be so that just like the only difference between two people is like the the buttons they press right but like the difference should be the choices they made going into that encounter. And that is what they're taking away by making it not a choice that's actually based on the encounter, just a choice you made back in September when the expansion came out or October when the expansion came out. You know, yeah. the difference between me and some other hunter on his office is like, you know, hey, I chose to play this Azurite that's different than them. I chose to play this uh, this tr talent that's different well, that's than them. Well, that's a decision, right? Yeah, that, and that's, that is something that is awesome and it is a choice. And the choice actually goes away when you make it something that is not tied to the encounter, that is not tied to, the, you know... The, the short term, right? Or the raid instance, or yeah. the, the, he, the, the subset of dungeons that you're doing. It, it's whatever, much more right? satisfying to do more or less damage because you chose something different for that encounter rather than, well, this person wanted to be a vampire and this one wanted to be, uh, you know, a glowy furry. Ooh, woo. So. <laughs> um, They're sorry. called a night fade, Dratnos. I'm sorry, I, I forgot. Um, Fine. <laughs> just just my last point i think there's just a lot of people that are also just this is change this is the first time we've seen uh, like a a power affecting choice in wow you know in bfa we heard oh player's choice is awesome like do more player's choice and now we get a, a massive player's choice and people are freaking out about it and potentially rightfully so but i think there's just a lot of people that are this is change arms in the air freak out but trying to tell them exactly why you're upset is definitely the way to go and we'll see yeah. what happens in the future yeah, I, I, I really hope they come up with a great system on this where I actually where the problems get solved because the abilities themselves are just so cool. The covenant abilities. I think, the, I think that that's the problem is that they're the just so badass. Look yeah. fucking dope. Yeah, it, they look so just interesting. Okay, there's some that are like not fun. There's a lot of very interesting covenant abilities, uh, and even like the secondary ability effects and like the. The soul binds turning even. into the wolf. Like, yeah. yeah, exactly. And like the door of shadows and stuff like that. There's so many cool abilities that not being able to even use any of them because you made a decision sucks. All right. All right. Let's move on from this to uh, the rest of our, our show this week. Yeah, we could talk about that forever. We really could. We'll try not to do it every week because I know that. I think that, that is, I think that is a, a great uh, lengthy discussion as to how we feel about it, though. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to our tip of the week segment. My tip of the week is one that uh, you may not actually be aware of this, but if you are somebody who plays on PTR, Tournament Realm, or on beta, there is an add-on that can change your life. Uh, less so on beta, more so for Tournament Realm and for PTR, but it still, I think, can be used for beta. I'm actually not 100% sure on that. It's an add-on called My Slot, and this is an add-on that 
lets you copy your character's like keybind setup and bindings and what buttons are where. C bars. Your char- yeah, all your character val- variables, all those things that you can't actually import with like an add-on profile or whatever. And it lets you just copy all those things from one character and then paste them over onto a new character. And it, it saves you hours of setting up new characters on Tournament Realm. Uh, if you're somebody who's ever competed in like an MBI or whatever, uh, it's really fast for copying over into PTR. Somewhat useful on beta, although in beta there's so much to change that it's you know less less helpful there. But it's good um, to get your binds set up for yeah. like what goes and what uh, part. It also copies over macros and stuff like that too. There, there's a lot of very useful uh, portions of my slot. Yeah, so right. add-on you may not be aware of, but extremely useful if that's something that you are about to do. All right, Trail. What is your tip of the week? Um, mine this week is about shrines. Since we're still in BFA, I'm going to try to stick to BFA stuff for now. But the Gale Caller Apprentices, I think, in shrines, what they're called, they cast a, a cast called Tempest, and it's a slow moving tornado that goes out toward a player. And it's claimed many ranged lives that reach out while they play instead of watching their screen. So any player can take care of these Tempest casts. And even if you have like a 45 second kick, as long as you have something to stop the cast, it won't recast. And that's that's a good version of a mob in the game as well. Chunkar has a lot of these mobs where if you kick or stun them, they won't recast, which is what we like to see. But these are the case in trying. So you can like alternate your kick as a ranged DPS and then uh, Intimidation as a hunter for the second one and then your kick again for the third, etc. Yeah, I, I think this is... Okay, I, I think that you uh, putting this blame on poor range DPS is ill, ill-founded. ill I believe that mostly melee died to the, the Tempest going off. Well, because yeah, the, 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 ra- the range can help stop it from going off. If you're melee, you don't really have huge amounts of time to react. Although, Although you do have some. Bro, I'm standing 35 yards away. I'm not going to get hit by the sword. <laughs> just saying, I've seen several range in my day AFK and just watch it slowly go to them across the screen. I'm like, watch out, there's a tornado. Watch out, and then they just die. Yeah, I, I, I do think this is a great example of like awesome ability design in a dungeon as well, where it's like, it's kickable, it's stunnable, it's dodgeable, you know, pick your poison, do something to not die to it, but if you don't do anything, you're going to die to it. That is a great place, I think, for an ability to land. Although, Alternatively, just like take two steps, but yeah, that's, yeah, there's a lot of counterplay for these, which is a good ability. All right, next one comes from Squishy, who has the clip for us that was mentioned earlier. Great choice here. This is uh, from yes. <laughs> from the Rating for Rain charity event, uh, and we can see it I'll find it. I'll find uh, it. It is so. basically just showing that the Tettles right, double fix on Corey. We don't have oh. anything to stop the maggot. Hey, dude, two burning shots. <laughs> I don't understand anymore, dude. That's like, how does this even maggots. happen? Oh, sorry. Uh, so, for full context, I was tanking this dungeon, and I we needed to stop on the maggot. I'm like, oh, I got this. I typhoon it. And it flies into the air, dude. I just don't understand anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everybody just kind of goes crazy when it happens as well in the, uh, in the clip. You guys should watch that. <laughs> you just look at Troll's face. <laughs> Hang on, let's see, if we, let's see if we get that. Just, whoa. <laughs> Remarkable. Uh, <laughs> That's so funny. Like, of course it happened with Tuttle's tanking. I've, I've never seen a mob go above Z-axis and underot ever, and I've done that dungeon probably like 300 times in this expansion. And then Tuttle's walks in and tanks either. it once and sends a maggot like 50 feet in the air somehow. Dude, I've literally never seen that before either. I, I just don't understand. And it's like, oh, we need to stop on this. All right, Typhoon. And then it's just gone. I'm like, Tuttle's brought the toll to gore to underot. Yeah. He's just... Well, granted, nobody ever goes over there and pulls that pack. I... I... I did not believe in like the Bermuda Triangle until I met Tettles. And that's when I learned that like there can just be areas or people or whatever that are cursed and that unexplainable things happen only to them or in that area or whatever. So all right, Tettles. Let's <laughs> let's move on to your uh, your clip here. We had the temple of Sethralis, uh Hoodoo Hexer Shroud Concealment cheese ability thing uh, so basically you need to make sure that avatar of Sethralis is covered in the shroud the rest of the group is covered in the shroud except for the tank the tank is standing out uh, and then all of those hoodoo hexers should like group up right on top of the tank because they're not able to get a uh, line of sight on avatar of Sethralis on the middle of the platform to be able to channel their ability into them so then they'll be able to group up and you just blow them up you could actually even see in that clip that's out of the intermission. You can do this out of the intermission if you want. Yeah, it's a van- vanish can, shroud. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the rogue can vanish off combat uh, of that boss. I don't really know why because you can't really like 
ping death or anything else off. But Rogue can vanish off combat of the boss and you can do it on the immersion. I find the best amount of success in phase one. I, th I think that the first phase, uh, you use it in that, and then you bloodlust second phase. That will typically be the, the easiest way of being able to deal with this. Yeah, it's a very, very powerful it's, strat. It's worth yeah. noting after some science myself too that the rogue casting shroud should use cloak so they have no chance of being broken out of their shroud by the boss's AoE damage that comes in at a, at a random interval at the start of the fight or the intermission. Oh, and also, okay. Yeah, they should, they should, you can cloak while shrouding, by the way, in stealth. So you don't have to do it right away. You can wait. And also, the tank should go attack the mobs as soon as they spawn just to get them like queued up to, tr to try to melee the tank and break their spell queue on channeling on the boss. But yeah, it's a really interesting mechanic. Do you yeah. think that this should be fixed? Or is this like clever use of game mechanics? I think that this is clever use of game mechanics. I don't think that this is like fixable territory. It's close, but it doesn't inherently break the fight and you can only do it once per rogue you have, right? I would fix it. I, to me, this is like this is obviously not how this fight's I, supposed to work. You know, it makes I, it so easy. I don't know. It seems pretty. It, it is. It is pretty bad. I, I wouldn't <laughs> ban or anything for it. I would just fix it. Yeah, so I, what, I, what does it really save you? Like maybe forty-five seconds, maybe thirty seconds. Yeah, but it also I makes mean, it easy. The the time it takes the to kill day. all who do. Got to say, yeah. it's, it's, it saves you the time to kill all Hoodoo hexers. Plus, the boss is immediately healable. If you do it after the second, uh, the first intermission. Theoretically, you don't need to kill any of the adds. The healer can immediately top off, and you can kill all the adds with the from the second second phase with the buff. Oh, really? Because the the thing that makes the boss immune is the is one hoodoo hexer channeling on the boss. So and they, no they don't actually channel on it. On boss. Wow. Is that actually wait? So you is could that just actually how you can do that? Okay, I, I didn't. I believe so. I thought they were still channeling on him, or they still started channeling on him like once the shroud ended. But if I, they don't, I don't Okay. Uh, no, they, just, they, they only try it one time. Once then, they fail, well, they then yeah, then you just bomb heals forever. into avatars of Thralis and you win. Jeez. Yep. And they also don't do anything but melee the tank, and they don't melee very hard. So it's like literally you just break the fight. And do yeah. It okay. Free. Never mind. If if you can actually just immediately top off the boss, that's not. <laughs> I, 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 think, I think I think it is clever use. Much. I think it is clever use of game mechanics. I think it is too far though. Yeah. Exactly. Like I, I would be, I would not ban for it, but I'm yeah. That. Mm -hmm. It's definitely cool tech because. The, they, they're trying to cast, they need a target, they don't have a target, they fail, they, they go for the tank. I think the part where it breaks is after the boss shows up again, they should rechannel. Yeah, so, so you can you would be able to group them up. To group them, but then, yeah. But then you, they would channel and you do the fight, and I think that would be fine, but the fact that they don't channel at all is where the fight breaks. And I still... I think they fix it. I still even think grouping them up I would fix. I, I just make it so that they, they're like rooted mobs that, that just stand still. I think that... I think grouping them up is really powerful. They're they're not fixing it. It's so late. obviously they're not going to fix it. But I would if I will. You know, if I, the Temple of Thralis has been Temple of Thralis was just abandoned. Whatever they decided, it wasn't going to be in the MDI. They just they just you know threw that right out of their mind. For as far as they're concerned, that's a Legion dungeon now. That's a that's legacy content. You know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, um, let's move on to uh, talking a little bit about Shadowlands M+. So we got the four dungeons that are currently on Shadowlands. Um, we'll do, I guess we, we're, we've kind of already used up quite a bit of our time, so we'll do this reasonably quickly. Not, we don't need to bullet time it, but let's start off by talking about the Necrotic Wake, um, this dungeon. So which, who who has the, uh, is this trial? Is this you? Yeah, I kind of wrote down some mobs and bosses I wanted to mention, and... Stuff that seems pretty scary and I think will scale hard in the dungeons. The first one in Necrotic Wake is the Zolramus Gatekeeper, and there are a couple of these mobs in the first boss area surrounding the arena. And they they look to me like the Mariner and Mob Souls, like they do a huge AoE channel, I think, on the group. I don't know if it's dodgeable. It looks like it's probably dodgeable and maybe outrangeable because he shoots like little missiles and AoE patterns all over the floor around him. Oh, cool. I don't know if you guys have fought this guy, but he does a lot of damage. He, he does, yeah. Which one is this guy? Hold on. It's the guy guarding the portal in the first area. The Zoramus Gatekeeper, yeah. Up on the page oh. above where you are. Yeah. Okay. You you got gived by him randomly, and we had no idea yes, what you I got gived by him because I got I took a 10k dot tick randomly. I only have 22,000 health. Yeah, so that guy's scary. I'm not sure exactly how it works. I've, I haven't done these dungeons enough I yet. I think he's but... bugged. I'm not exactly sure. So I was taking 1,000 ticks of damage for a little bit, and then I randomly took a 10,000 hit of damage, and I just sat there. I'm like, I, I don't know why. Yeah. Maybe you got overlapped by multiple projectiles or something. 
a, a, I got overlapped by a 1,000% damage increase, yeah. Yeah, just 10 projectiles. Alternatively, the Tettles effect. True. Well, True. Moose died to it, like, <laughs> Moose died to it 20 <laughs> seconds later or whatever, too. I mean, but you had, were the key, so. <laughs> okay, we had three people die to it. Yeah, but you, you, you were in the key for all of them. All right, how about the, um, <laughs> how about the, uh, the skeletal monstrosities? Yeah, so there's a giant... I think there's only one or two, maybe, but there's this giant skeletal monstrosities that patrol slowly in the second boss area, and they do a ginormous tank hit. I think it's physical damage, looked like to me, and it stacks, so you cast again before your stack falls off, kind of like a Berserker Bleed in King's Rest. Is it a dot, uh, or is it just a damage taken increase? It's just a damage taken increase by the same ability. Okay. 100% no, damage taken increase. Yeah, he, he hits really hard. He does a slow AoE, I think. I think he has plenty of time for the tank to kite, but that... I might end up one-shotting on the first stack on, like, uh, relatively so high keys. I found out something really interesting about that. It's uh, it's an anti-tank kite mechanic. It's an anti-kite, yeah. I, killed oh, right. I, ran away, I ran away to reset my stack on a Mythic 10. It insta-give Jada my healer. Is it parryable? Oh, yeah. Is it Love by those. any chance parryable or dodgeable? Don't think so. We one I don't think it's dodgeable. Oh, wait, no, I was playing Brew. Yeah. So it's, it is, but it is treasable. It is oh, treasable hunt, hunter pet bop, uh, immune taunt. Oh, it is hunter pet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. or or warlock uh, void walker. Although hunters aren't playing with pets in uh, in that expansion so far, right? They're playing the uh, they're playing the other spec, the the, the marksmanship one. <laughs> the mark the marksmanship. Although one. you can oh, yes. summon a pet even if you have lone wolf, right? You can you can summon and taunt, and you just lose some damage while it's out, right? Yeah. So that actually He's could also... work. Yeah. He's also a lieutenant. I'm pretty sure you're going to be skipping him. Like, I'm pretty sure you're going to be skipping most of that area because trash count is probably yeah. very, very easy to get in that dungeon. Um, to move on, it's just nice to have options, you know. Yeah, and that isn't one of them. <laughs> yeah, that that whole area is actually really scary. There's also <laughs> the uh, Solramus Necromancer packs surrounding that guy, and each of these packs have a varying amount of mobs and a necromancer in the middle, and he controls. The rest of the mobs. So as soon as you kill the necromancer, everything dies. It's kind of cool lore-wise, but they're usually hard to group up. There's like an archer, a caster, maybe even two or three of those mobs spread out around the necromancer. Very, very difficult to group without some kind of LOS or mass grip. Yeah. So that, I think those packs would be really challenging too. The 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 grouping of those mobs, even on uh, what, I don't even know the bird boss's name, second boss in that instance, grouping up the the casters on that boss even is pretty rough. Yeah, there's archers, there's casters, there's belly boys, and I'm pretty sure he summons five mobs. There's six targets on the fight. Yeah. Uh oh, I can't hit that many. That's All right. I know. Uh, right? Alert. There's so many pulls, by the way, that have way more than five mobs. Like normal pulls, just pulling one pack, and it's <laughs> bewildering to me. Why? Something that Mickel says that's actually hilarious is that whenever we did a ten earlier, we did fifty percent in the first area, and then death ran until the second boss because you get fifty percent after you teleport up, anyways. Yeah. Oh, there, there is so in the third. <laughs> that's what I say about trash count in the third boss arena. You get four, uh, four packs and two, two patrols. Every single one of them needs to be pulled. Then you get two mobs solo. Those need to be killed. Then you get four mobs solo. Those need to be killed. Then four mobs solo again. Those need to be killed. And then it's the boss. Gauntlet. Yeah, you have a gauntlet of trash that is managed. that gives count. Okay, nice. Yeah. So you need, you can you need to skip so much trash in that instance to make it work, or they just need to increase trash count limit. And I honestly think that they should do the latter. I think that I agree. I think that incre yeah, I think increasing so. the amount of account that you need for that dungeon seems reasonable, especially because fifty percent of the count is uh, like needed via a gauntlet. Yeah, I think it's just a natural issue in the dungeon where if you pull. Uh, a natural path just straight to the bosses you end up with like 80 percent count or something before the third boss and you can get away with just pulling 47 percent uh thd said in chat which is a big disparity they need to do something about that so uh so something also that i did notice in this dungeon is that there's no checkpoint after the second boss so you have to run back from the very beginning of the instance which i think is mega mega scuffed dude can we get okay yeah. yes if we could get, so besides the Covenants thing, there are a bunch of things that are like a third of a percent as important as the Covenants thing. One of them is checkpoints. Can we just get checkpoints after every boss, please? Just just whenever you kill a boss, you get a checkpoint. If we could just have that be the rule, that would be, I would be so happy. Infinitely better than this arbitrary shit that we got right now. <laughs> Second thing, delete our health zones when a dungeon starts. Like, just if we've got health zones in our bags, just delete them. Make it so we can't bring them into the dungeon. Like, 
I agree with that. that I, I hate switching over to Warlock alts or whatever. Even if Warlocks are good yeah. next expansion, it's still just going to be so awkward to... I just, I hate that. So uh, that's, that's my I, other It consumes so much time. Mm-hmm. And they've tried to fix it in the past. They removed the training grounds. They removed ground, the training grounds, yeah. Training grounds, yeah. <laughs> just for that reason. And they left the ability to invite a Warlock and get Hellstones. Like, I, I, just go all the way or don't do anything at all, please. On that note, do you think they should wipe buffs too? Just wipe all buffs, make you rebuff as the. You talking about like starts? meta and celestial, or yeah, yeah, oh yeah, I definitely. Mean, like just because because some things some things reset, some things don't. Literally, just wipe the board of all buffs. Yeah, and just shroud, make you rebuff. Shroud and celestial alignment and meta, none of that shit should exist. Yeah, reset all cooldowns, remove all buffs. I'd be fine with keep like I, I'd actually be fine with if they have the technology to like let us keep battle shout if there's a warrior in the group. I'm fine. I'm fine with that if they have the technology for that, but. I would also no, be fine with just rebuffing it. I'm, I'm totally fine with wiping that too. Yeah. Like, like, you have in, 10 seconds to rebuff. Like. You increase the timer to 20 seconds if people get confused. You know, whatever. That's still better. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I'd be fine with it. Uh, we, got, we got Mists. <laughs> mists of Turnus so, yeah. Scythe. Yeah. Is that pronounced that correctly? Was, that was a Necrotic Wake. Uh, I don't think there was any other glaring mobs or scaling things that I noticed so far, okay, but I've so- only done that dungeon once. Something that I thought was actually cool about Necrotic Wake, again, are the buffs, like, abilities that you're able to grab off the ground, I think are dope. Yeah, that oh, uh, yeah. that has been that was one of my favorite things playing it back when Alpha first came out, because it was the first dungeon in Alpha, right? Um, yeah. And that, yeah, that owns. Uh, like, having... It's this kind of natural evolution of, the, like, the cannon section in Toldegore or whatever, or the spotters in, in Siege of Browse. Or oh, the where, shock like, bots. It's like, it's like yeah. the shock bots done well. Yeah, so making it so that it's like an active choice on how to use it. It's like one time use for each of these things and they're powerful, but like interesting when you have to decide how to use them. That is really cool. So the way that it works in the crowd ways, there's just these these like weapons all over the ground and you could like, one of them's like a javelin that pierces through stuff and does a huge bleed. And one of them's like a big AoE stun thing. And uh, you get to use each of them once. And it is, I think just a perfect blend of like, you still have agency over what you're doing in the dungeon. Your class abilities all still matter with these things. But it also is a way that, you know, you use the dungeon thing to do the dungeon. So Mikkel says, uh, the weapons going away whenever you die seems rather punishing. Would, re- would like them to persist through death. I have the opposite take. I think that, the, I think that do not die with, the, with, with them in your inventory. Just do not die. Like, straight, I, straight up. I'd be fine with like, if you. Have to, if you have to delay picking them up, you should. What if you have to like go back to the start of the dungeon to pick one up? For it? Like I feel like it's pretty. It is pretty punishing. I, I I don't like things where you get punished more for death. It's like the shockbots thing, right? Like getting the shockbot going away when you die leads to why junkyard is such a. You just feel like you're in checkmate thing. when you die and you haven't. You don't have your bots for the part that you need the bots for. I'm fine. Yeah, true. I, so I, I I would like to keep it as, to, for them to be persist through death as well. So so you actually have an active decision for when you use them as opposed to sometimes you <laughs> sometimes you just well, lose them. Make, let me just pop it. Well, and if, if your route relies on you having a, a weapon that you pick up in the first boss room for the third boss trash or whatever, you know that that shouldn't get deleted because you die midway through because you already get punished for dying. Dying is already bad. Yeah, we don't, that, we don't need to what? make it Never worse mind. to die. You're right. I agree with that. I agree with that sentiment. Yeah. What what what? Just to follow up on that, you can take weapons from M Zero and take them into Mythic Plus. So right, that's a bug. Halt! <laughs> yeah, halt that one. That's that's. that's... A... Oh man, Wipe yeah. The buff. I hope that gets fixed. Wipe all that's, buffs. That's bad shit. Yeah. Also, if you're a non tank player, probably don't use the spear on pull on a pack. My healer did it and instantly got aggro and died. It does a lot of damage. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> troll. <laughs> For, for most of them, the tank is probably the one using it anyways, I think, because they're yeah. in melee range, guaranteed melee range and have control over the bobs. So. Yeah, yeah, the probably. spear, though, does the piercing effect, right? You might actually want somebody who can get a good trajectory lined up on it. Yeah, I, I, I think it'd probably cool be better player. for someone else to use it. I bet, we, I bet you while you channel it or, or cast, I don't know if there's cast time, but I bet you while you cast it, you can't block or parry your dodge. So Yeah, I bet you want your hunter to do it with misdirection on your tank. <laughs> Bang. Best of both worlds. Yeah, that'd be good. Or a rogue. Yeah. No, no, no. Rogues are banned in Shadow Lake. <laughs> um, they, they cheated death. They're no longer allowed to come with us. <laughs> they're, they're just standing out there in Ice oh. Grand Citadel like, hey, why am I still here, guys? What the hell? Why, why is everybody gone? Uh, that actually reminds me. I should have included a clip, but the cheat death soul bind. Uh, I can't remember which covenant it is. Do you guys remember? With this two. Yeah. Okay, well, well one with of the them. The NFA one? The pod one? No, I think it's the other one. Mm. So it's not the egg, it's the other one? Oh, I saw th- I saw this happen on um, this, Growl's yeah, stream. I yeah. I forgot to get the clip, but 
this uh, cheat death like is currently bugged and doesn't go on cooldown. So the rogue was at the entrance of the dungeon where you pre-release and respawn, and the mobs were just killing the rogue over and over and over and over and over and over, like proccing his cheat death, but he was still alive, but it was still adding deaths to the dungeon. So they uh, racked so up like 200 it, deaths in one minute or something. Is it an interaction with cheat and cheat? Like both of them probably? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> It was, they, they got they, their time just fell out of their timer uh, in that first boss room and just entirely disappeared. 290 deaths or something. Okay, um, Mrs. Turn of Scythe. So this one is a, a bit of a weird dungeon. There's some, there's some interesting stuff going on in here. What's your takeaway from this one, uh, Drell? This is currently my favorite dungeon. I really like it. Uh, even on Mythic Plus, it feels really, really good. The maze is really fun to do. You have to do some group group gameplay together to decipher the mists. You know, everybody has to stand near the whatever they're called obelisks and then see the patterns and decide which way to go. Uh, really, really balanced dungeon. It seems like so far with the mobs versus bosses until the very last boss, which is ridiculously hard right now. So, is is discerning the pattern going to be the healer job? You think? Um. I think, think it could be anyone. Be, I think I think, think every player range. should go stand next to a I think, rock. I think it's I think it's either going to be a healer range. I think that's generally going to be the best options because you're able to stand far while continuing to do what you need to, and uh, like stand on the totem and like try to decipher like what's good and what's bad. This dungeon I think has the biggest potential to be one that is completely untimable versus super timable, depending on where they put the amount of time that you could that you, that they allot for you in the maze. Because for somebody whose group works together very efficiently, you can gain so much time in that maze because you don't spend any time sitting around trying to figure out which path you're supposed to take. But for a group that is super inefficient and like people aren't standing on the pillars and stuff like that, and you're taking, you know, a minute. I'm okay with it being per. aggressively tuned, man. Like, if you're gonna be stupid about the maze, like, you should be punished. Dude, I cannot wait for that to be an MDI. I cannot wait for a team <laughs> that's to, like, what I was thinking. punt the, the like maze. Sent back yeah. to the yeah. <laughs> Whenever somebody dies, they just have, you're just like, mass roast me, please. <laughs> it reminds me of the clip in Black or Cole and MDI and Legion where Rich Campbell started laughing maniacally when someone got hit by the boulder a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> Chris and I are going to watch some group just like pick the wrong path and instantly get sit back to the start. Dreadless and I are just going to try to not just like die laughing as they all get shipped back to the start. You're like, I don't know, man. <laughs> um, okay, what about this last boss fight uh, of the dungeon? Treadova. Oof. This last boss is a really interesting one. There's there's a new kind of mechanic uh, where in phase two and then phase three, more specifically, he starts to predict your movement when he casts his swirly mechanic at the feet of the players. Yeah, is this the clip from Fragments that we have? Is that should I be playing that now? Yes, that that okay. is the the clip from Fragments we have. You could just show it in the background. They they had a a hour and a half long progression session on Gahoon. Yeah, I, lo I love the reuse of the Gahoon model. Yeah, we're just going to call it Gahoon, actually. So yeah, on this Gahoon fight, you can see there's there's several things going on at once, but the swirlies that come out every 10 seconds, 15 seconds, maybe, are the really dangerous part, where not only are they invisible in most parts of the encounter at the moment, I think that's just a bug, they're going to fix that, but the uh, they're also predicting your movement, so you see the players like sporadically moving around away from the boss to try to get ahead of the projectile and not let it hit them. Yeah, you just uh, you hope that you you know juke them. The, the, the invisibility part of it just has to be a bug, right? Hopefully. Hopefully. Hopefully, so, yeah. man. It's hard to no, tell. There's a lot there's of things no going on. It's going to be intentional. There's right. also another another bad thing about the fight, though. In phase three, there's a mind controlling parasite, and instead of a normal mind control where you can only hit the player and it, and it breaks them out once they hit a certain threshold. The parasite is targetable, and the player is targetable, and the player dies before you can kill the parasite on plus ten already, which is like a Lord Storm Song type of scaling oh. problem. That that mechanic is ridiculous, by the way. Like, it, it is absolutely brutal to have to a group up because there's so many abilities in this fight that force you to spread out. You have to group up around this thing, especially if you have melee, to kill this parasite without auto-cleaving and killing your team member, which is taking dot damage the longer the parasite is on the team member. Yeah, the, the player should definitely not be targetable. I don't understand what the deal is there, but hopefully they fix that. I've reported already. Hopefully well, other there, people have it's, too. There's it's just like a, a lot of abilities that are 
Uh, like whenever you get MC'd, okay, Ignite, I guess Ignite is probably the best one. Uh, there are a lot of abilities that will just auto cleave and murder people. Ignite doesn't as... auto cleave in Shadowlands, though. You okay, know, you, you have Centragosa or something, man. <laughs> Say you're hitting the, the the mind control parasite and you have breath running and it hits like another target and you just insta kill them with breath. And you're just like, all right. Oopsie, yeah. Yep. And the thing, the thing is, I don't think this is a bug. I think it is a designed decision that. Oh, I it's a bug. Have it. you been in this? There's a lot of bugs. Okay. Well, I mean, the, the way the fight works is as he goes from phase to phase, he gains intelligence. In phase one, that is in a, a, like a pacify. Like they have to, uh, your teammates have to kill the, the bug on top of you to unpacify you. In, in, in phase two, it's a stun. And in phase three, they chose a mind control, which I get the theme. I don't think that's the right, the right answer. Yeah, maybe make it like a fate. charm that walks, like a, like a queen's decree beckon thing that walks you to somewhere bad. I mean, that's just, fine. A, but you're still not targetable. Yeah. Like, it's a natural escalation of pacify, which you have control, stun, mm -hmm. which you lose control, and then, like, a third one. I mean, I get the hostile thing, but... Ugh, I don't think that works well from a gameplay perspective. Yeah, me either. Like, every class has some kind of passive cleave that you can't control easily, right? I, I think making it some kind of hostile thing where, like, you hurt your group when you're parasited is fine. Just make it so that... You don't actually have this risk of you getting killed before you get broken out of the parasite. Make like make it so that you uh, maybe you're not mind controlled, but like you start pulsing damage to your group while you're while you're stunned and infested. Yeah, they they can do that thing where they force you to cast something like the number of fights where they have. Oh yeah, like mental decay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is a good example of something that we should be looking for in the beta to let the developers know about in advance before Mythic Plus starts going higher and higher and higher through the expansion because that mechanic will get way out of hand. Like, there's no saving that player already on plus 10. And that's a glaring issue. All right. Uh, Halls of Atonement. What's your take on this one, Trial? Halls of Atonement seems like a really clean dungeon so far. Like, mobs are pretty balanced as well, just like in Mists of Tyrannus Scythe. Scythe, however you pronounce that. Um, I noticed a couple bleeds in the dungeon. The Kyrian potion that clears bleeds, curses, diseases, poisons, yes, whatever, it seems really powerful. I think it probably also clears necrotic, by the way. Um, great ability. The the hard thing in that dungeon that seems out of tuning is the second boss named Echelon. You open the door and then he surprise attacks you and uh, summons a bunch of imps and kills you. But the, so. I actually think that there's an interesting strategy on this fight. I think you can actually line the imp, like the far side imps, uh, with like some of the the wall geomet the, with the geometry of the wall. Like obviously he drops his pup, so it's not optimal. Yeah, but being kinda. able to line line the imps in is it, it can be advantageous. The fight is definitely overtuned though currently. So to to kind of give context to the fight, there's six, he summons six imps frequently, who yes. all cast from ranged. Six, by the way. So that's seven total, just in case you're... Wait a second, hang on. Count. That's more than I can hit. No, no, no. That's I can seven hit targets. Oh. There's, <laughs> si there's Alert. six in their spread, like, with, like, yeah. like, I don't know, 35 yards away or some shit. Oh, okay, well, then I couldn't hit him anyways. Yes, yeah, it's, it's two sets of three, and you, you can kick them in, and you need to kick them in because they don't die. In order to actually kill them, you need to take their HP to zero, and then the boss does a giant leap, and you need him to leap on top of the, at the ads to kill them. So you need them grouped. So you need to use like all your utility of kicks, knocks, and like all this stuff to get them in and then leap on top of them. And that's just brutal in itself. But then there's this curse. Yes, it's a curse, not a magic spell, by the way, which stuns the entire group. And you have, I think, like a one or two second timer to dispel the curse on the player targeted by the leap so that they can actually put the leap on top of the ads. Yes. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's brutal. It's incredibly quick, which right now without... Uh, like add-ons or LVR or anything, it's it's very <laughs> challenging for me to be able to tell who it's on because also the on-screen echelon is leaping on whoever just says your name, so you can't... I thought he was leaping... Sang, Sang and I were both in the dungeon together, and we both thought that he was leaping on us, so we just spelled ourselves. <laughs> it was not on either of us. <laughs> yeah, you only get one like one second as well. And once you get the curse, you, really, you literally can't move more than like five yards away before you get stunned. It's, it slows you so much. So you have to be like ready to go into the imps, and the other players have to be ready to get away from the imps so you don't get hit by the stomp. Um, but yeah, all that all that together, coming together for one boss fight, I think is a little too much, especially for pug groups. Like, I don't know how you would be able to 
assign three kicks for a dungeon boss, assign like the positioning for the puddles, where you want to put the imps, where you want to gather them on the tank, all within like a tiny little circle so the boss can hit them in one jump. I think it's just like slightly too much for pugs. Okay, but hear I me could out. Be wrong. I think I think that there's a great solution to this. You don't have six spawn at once. You only have three, and they all spawn from one side. Uh, I think that's fine. I, uh, Jade and I were talking about it, and it's just delay the the second wave and the third, like to increase the time between spawns. Right now, you have two you have two jumps to clear all the ads. Uh, usually, the first one misses because it's lined up very close to the ad spawn. Yeah. Um, but if you got three jumps per ads, so that you know you had more time, you don't have to deal. You can deal with three on the second leap and three on the the, the last leap. That's fine too. Um. The boss well, is definitely... It has the elderly axa problem. The elderly axa on release problem where it's like one ad spawns and two ad spawns and three ad spawns. You're just like, I don't even know what I would do at this point. But like, it... so the first set is normally not that bad because you have all of your your kicks and your CC abilities up. But say you have uh, CC abilities that are on a minute cooldown, they're not going to be up for every ad wave. And you're not going to be able yeah. to group up mobs. They're for every other. Yeah. Like... It's like so. Typhoon's gonna be up for every set. Ring of Peace is not gonna be up for every set. Other than that, though, the dungeon itself it's it kinda was kind of sick. It was, yeah. it was, I liked it. Was it, yeah. nice. it we did it in like twenty three minutes on a ten with no fixes. But like compared to the others, this one the timer almost felt too long, or the dungeon was under tuned. This is one where the the last three bosses are basically just boss, 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 right? There's yeah. I think yeah. I think you need more count. I, I think that that dungeon could also uh, like utilize you needing to gain more count because it felt like we pulled very uh, linearly for how the dungeon was structured, which is good. But I think you should have to deviate off a little bit. Yeah, yeah it is just, an open dungeon. That's true. Yeah. You should have to make some choices of where to get extra count, I think. I think that should be true for all dungeons. I think I think they should like map out the natural path through the dungeon and then make you get like ten or twenty percent more count than that. And that way, like if you want to skip something from the natural path, you still can. You just get need to get even more elsewhere. And otherwise, you're like you're still looking for an opportunity to pull something from off the beaten path. Yep, I agree. Yeah. All right, uh, let's talk about Plague Fall. Trail. Man, this dungeon is full of poisons and diseases. If you don't have a poison or disease to spell in your group, um, considering. Consider bringing someone that does. <laughs> you mean a poison and a disease? Because you're definitely going to have one or the other. More likely than not, I, I get. Well, I guess you could have a shaman heal. I guess you could have a shaman healer. But I'd say, like, I'd say disease was exponentially more important in this dungeon than poison. A lot of the trash. I think there's probably like five trash diseases and diseases good on the boss and all this stuff. It's overwhelming. How much there's, diseases there are? Yeah, there's a ton. In the in the second boss room, there's a there's pretty much a copy pasted pull from King's Rest where there's just a million slimes and then two big guys on the sides, and those slimes, they I pulled all of them and by the time they all got to me, I had 99 stacks. Like I don't even know what they're doing, but it hit me for 50k and I have 45k health as a tank right now. <laughs> they're also and not I targetable by. <laughs> They're also not targetable by like AOE ability because they're not like a, they're not coded as in combat. So shit like Starfall just does not hit them, and that that actually tilted me pretty hard. Yeah. So they, Talk they about, made okay, target cap by the. <laughs> they they made these slimes. Previously, they were like exactly the king's rest slime, super slow, kind of just did nothing except melee or tank. They're now like lightning fast. They're like, so fast. They're dude. they're like two hundred percent movement speed of of a player, and for every second. That you stand next to one slime, you get a stack of a debuff. That will <laughs> destroy you if you stand too close. It's it's the tiniest rage, but because they move so fast, if you pull the entire room, you're dead before, like Charles said, before you can even group them up because of how fast they are and how quickly you'll gain stacks. That pull is ridiculous now. Pretty I mean, cool. maybe it's designed to like have to use AMS or the Kyrian potion that clears that kind of thing, but I I don't know. Like it seems they're, way too fast. They're also what debuff. 50 mobs in that room or something like there's some absurd number of blocks i'd, I'd in that say room. like 20 to 25 yeah it's some just absurd number so maybe they just expect you to do it in four or five pulls yeah we did it in three i got to like 30 stacks then rolled out like rolled out then you got double ursul's vortex yeah Whew. yeah you rolled out and they were still with you because they're faster than your roll speed <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, <my God>. <laughs> They're they're really fast though, and like for melee, like we didn't have a melee DPS in our in our group, but they would constantly have to just basically the more you pull, the faster they would need to basically just dip in and out of melee range of the of the mobs, and that's just frustrating. 
Hmm. I wonder what the right answer to this is. Maybe, maybe just make it so that the debuff is like agnostic of how many you're fighting at once, and just like yeah. a one stack uh, per second type thing. I have a feeling this was added because everybody just saw King's Rest slime pull to number two and just pulled the entire thing. Interesting. I don't hate. Which is what we're gonna to try to do anyway, right? Like, of course. We're gonna we're gonna no matter how away. brutal it is, yeah, we're pulling all of them at once <laughs> if they're small. <laughs> Those are all of one type of mob that. Hmm, can I pull all of those together? They just need to no give them a cast. Just give them a cast that you can't interrupt all of them. All right, you know? so next part of Plaguefall, actually something that I thought of whenever we were doing the dungeon, is the shroud after, like, is the tech after the first boss you immediately shroud into the area where those guys carry the barrels and you just back pull all the oh, trash yeah. into the barrel guys like that that's definitely gonna be the tech for the that whole dungeon it's, it's right? spotters oh, right sure it's spotter that. it's spotter 2.0 right the barrels yes yeah. yeah how do you guys feel about this i i think that Hate. that is a a okay so i think I, I, the barrels themselves are just so fundamentally flawed and then they added barrels on wheels as a another solution of this and i'm just like hmm. the the mob barrels, I think, do less damage, and they don't pad as far unless somebody actually hits them. So their length of like their distance that you can actually chain them is further, uh, not as sorry, not as far as like barrels in the ground. So I think it is limited to an extent. I don't hate the barrels in the ground though. I think they're limited supply. They're target capped at five. Ah, uh, just like I me. Love how the barrels are target capped, man. The that barrels are target capped. Up. The barrels are target capped at five, and there's three like st stacked on top of one another, aren't there? There's like one, two, and then sets of three uh, yeah, scattered yeah, yeah. around. There's like, but the one one can hit the other ones too, and blow up the other ones. So I I, I think removing the barrels and just retuning how that portion of the instance is tuned is the play. Or ch change it from yeah. like a damage event to like a damage taken increase on the target or something. I think. I think, that's I think that that's I'd still like. going to be problematic because you got the barrels on wheels, dudes, that you're okay. going to literally just shroud into this event yeah, area maybe, maybe. and then just back pull all the trash on top of these guys. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Because they're infinitely spawning, too. So. All right. Um, other bosses in Plaguefall? Domina, Domina Venom Blade? Spider. I think all the bosses in this dungeon are really cool. I think the, the first boss, Glob, Glob, Grob, Grog, that's hard to say. Is like the most bland, but it's still a good boss. The uh, second boss that jumps around from platform to platform has a bunch of different mechanics that you have to know about and deal with individually and at the same time. Sometimes it's different players. It's that's really fun. But then yeah, the dominant boss, I think, unless you have range that really know how to deal with the puddles if they're really far away, I think you're just gonna die on for a while. Any range that can break out. So, so basically, the, she spawns four invisible guys around the room. And it seems just completely random where they spawn so far to me. But the ranged players have to cast some kind of AoE ability or a targeted ground effect to break these stealth guys out of their webs so that they can walk to the group and stop hurling daggers at the whole group. It's really easy for the tank to get the really close ones. You can just like use your movement to get out of the group and then come back in before you get stunned. Uh, also, I should have mentioned there's this mechanic on this boss where if you're out of the group at all for more than five seconds, you get stunned for ever. Yeah. You can, you can also like... I think it's cool that you can flare the mobs out too. And like, you can also use, I, I, you used to be able to typhoon them out. I'm not 100% sure if you can typhoon them out of the, the web still. Can you rop them out, Trell? Do you know? Oh, uh, I haven't tried rop. I've just been rolling into the close ones. Yeah, that, that, that's what I've been doing as well. We, we've just barreled our face into them mostly more than anything, just because yeah, that's you, what we decided you, to do. You just run into them and then you just immediately stack back up with your partner. Okay, then how about that last boss, Margrave Stradama? This is a really cool boss. I, um, th I think this is sick. This is like Avatar Sethros, but good, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. so there's there's a main boss in the middle, right? She's she's rooted. She uh, is a crazy poison lady, and she spawns these tank ads that you have to soak as a tank, and then also lots of dodging tentacles for the rest of the group to deal with and not get one shot at any point in the fight. So the tentacle patterns are really fun to see and what phases they come in while dealing with the rest of the mechanics. 
And the, but there's one pattern I think that's too much the uh, the clockwise, clockwise one or the <laughs> counterclockwise. I got killed the first time I saw it. I did. I was like, what the? Because I tried to follow Squishy and he rolled away and I couldn't like wild charge quick enough. And I got murdered by the <laughs> clockwise one. I was like, oh shit! That's when yeah. it just goes around in a circle, right? And you just need yeah. to like you need but, to but, get to where uh, it's going to end and then move to where it started as soon as the the started one slams, right? Th the problem is that the arm time on like the first two or three like going off is like a like way too quick for whenever you notice that it's near you and so say you're three tentacles deep on it you really want to move to the right but you actually should just move to the left and it's it's pretty deceiving yeah i think they just need to slow that the first like if they show the first tentacle for a little longer so that people can get into that position because you either you want to start at that single tentacle and then yes. just go left or right mm -hmm. if they if they keep right. that one up for a little longer i think it would it would help but the fight itself is like brilliant i think i think i think i think it's a good fight the, yeah it's really the, cool the, there's also these ads that move like mega slow and they hit like trucks and they are complete threat issues if your DPS go ham. Like when when I went in there, because I'd done it before, I was like, Tettles, you're going to want to starfall these. Don't starfall these until I have threat because they'll just kind of like come up behind you and just mail Did you Tettles starfall like, them before what the or after, after you was, had threat? Is Squishy realized that it <laughs> didn't matter anyways. And he said, you know what? Fuck it. You, you two Moonkins just pull both sides. And instead we pulled 12 mobs and just starfalled them to death. And Squishy was, just was, didn't gain threat. I, I, I was talking about the boss, but... Oh, okay, yeah, the yeah, boss yeah. spawns like four, four of the slow moving ads. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's four of the slow moving ads two, from the trash. Like, uh, yeah. it's, it's the exact same as the trash ads. All right, so as a whole, what's your take on these dungeons, uh, Trell? What, what, what's your opinion on, on them so far? I really like them so far. I don't like the mechanics that kill mobs for you, of course, but everything else feels really good. And aside from some random bosses that are overtuned, I think, they're in a good spot. Yeah, of course, th those sorts of tuning issues on random bosses in beta is like 100% to be expected as well. Yeah, uh, yeah that's totally fine. It's beta. Squishy, how about uh, you? What, what's your opinion on these? I, I, I'm also quite optimistic about these. They've taken a lot of things that were time-based, uh, problematic time-based when Tyrannical would be an issue, and moved it to percent-based or... Love a, that. A maximum number yeah. of phases. 33% like or two phases max and shit like that? You're like, there yeah. Because there, there is this boss that I think Jan knows you did as well, uh, the Necro Necrotic Wave, where you have to like hook the boss off using yeah. the, uh, the hook. He only seems to jump back once, meaning you need to hook him twice, and then he just stays down for the rest of the fight. So yeah, you, that owns. Then, then you're permanently phase two, and it's everything's great. And fantastic change. Yep, we like that. Scaling, that means it's going to scale well, basically, with Mythic Plus throughout the expansion. Right, a 30% health increase is not like a 50% time increase, but it's just a 30% time increase. Or a little bit more, but no. So. 35, yeah. Yeah, somewhere, because yeah. of course you get less cooldown time. Reasonable. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think they've done a good job of like assessing what the problems were with bosses and trying to make them a little bit better this expansion yeah I'm, I'm really hopeful about these things as well the the dungeons look sweet as well like the their the color palettes of everything and the the aesthetic of the dungeons i'm i'm hyped about it it looks like I, bfa there were a lot that i could kind of i i, I could have taken or left them I, I think they were all really well arted but I, the I actual the in terms of the aesthetics that i personally enjoyed is like freehold was was one that i liked and the others were like Okay, these are, you know, the art is good, but it's not my thing. Shadowlands has a massive advantage of uh, dungeons in the zone. This zone should stick to this color palette and theme. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so defined based on zone that I, I think that the color paletting and like the feel, the general feel of the dungeon is always, was always going to be successful. And I felt like they hit a good job of like how the dungeon is supposed to feel relative to where it is in the world. Heck yeah. All right. 90 minutes into our show now <laughs> with uh, with one topic still outstanding. I'm trying to think of the best answer for oh, what no. to do about it. Um, so, okay, let's, let's talk this out. Because option one is to do the topic. We could try and do the topic. I think yeah. we get an hour long with the preach interview. I think that this is just fine. We just land this. Okay, then let's do it. So our topic is how to deal with dungeons that you have never seen before. And that's something that, of course, we've all been interacting with on beta um it's something that you really need to learn how to do so typically the the thing you can do you may not want to do this but something that can really jumpstart your progression in a new dungeon is to research it uh so looking at videos of people like now do who's already done like all the available ones watching his team do the dungeons there is a lot of stuff that they learned and a lot of good ideas that they immediately have had 
when attacking those dungeons. So watching good players try and do the dungeon, even if you watch it on fast speed, even if you watch it while you're doing something else a little bit, that can help start building up for you some of the idea. However, for some people, that's not fun. Some people are interested in the first time they experience Plague Fall to be through a video or through a podcast, in which case, sorry, we ruined that for you with our whole show earlier. Um, but <laughs> but if you're somebody who mostly still wants to like play the dungeon and learn it through playing it, that's the main thing that I think we want to attack with this topic here. But again, a lot you can do with research in advance as well. Dungeon Journal too, very Absolutely. useful thing. That one, honestly, you should just be reading the Dungeon Journal. Even if even if you want to play the dungeon, read the Dungeon Journal first. Like, it, there's just so much time that you could spend, like spending ten minutes being like, "Oh, how did this ability that killed me work?" When it's literally just in the Dungeon Journal and explained for you. And uh, I, I think the Dungeon Journal for for all of the bosses is actually, I, I think that it is spot on, and it gives you a pretty good idea of how stuff is going to fundamentally work once you actually see it for the first time. For trash, you can normally just kind of AFK through, just kind of follow around other people and just kind of wing your way through it because it it won't require a significant amount of mechanics or things to be able to do. But for more intricate fights, those are normally present on the boss encounters. So reading the dungeon journal in advance and understand, like having a fundamental understanding of how the boss is going to work is normally going to be pretty good. And I had a, I had a good example. I, I felt like Dr. Ickes, the second boss in Plague Fall, was a great example of this. I, honestly, I would not have known what Dr. Ickes did unless I was explicitly told like what mobs to be hitting and what to not. Basically, there's an exploding ooze, and the mobs need to be tanked away from the exploding ooze because there's also a, a, a yeah, slime the that... Yeah, there's a the blue ooze, too. Yeah, there's a protective aura slime, and you just have to kill the explosive ooze with the protective aura slime being tanked away, and then you kill the protective aura slime second. And, like, it's... You need to be able to know stuff like that going into it because otherwise you're going to wipe the explosive is going off. But just read the dungeon journal, you'll be able to find out. I think drawing from past experiences is always important. Like yeah. Blizzard has been really, really good recently about taking from uh, having like universal symbols that you know what they mean. You know, when something is called, you know, healer or mender or <laughs> shaman or priest, like you, you, you pretty much know what that's going to do. That's a healing mob. Gonna do. Yeah. yeah, that's a healing mob. And you also, you, you kind of have this glossary built up in your head, like when there's a circle on the ground and it's got like a glowy graphic in it. And then when somebody yep. stands in it, the graphic goes away. You're like, oh. That should be something I should soak, yeah. Exactly. Or, or a volley ability. That, like, it's <laughs> an unnamed class fantasy volley ability. That's a kick. A bolt is typically on your tank and should be kicked intermittently as much as you possibly can. Yeah, but e even more recently, like like you said, the bomb. There is a bomb symbol above this slime that literally ticks down in a circle, and you're like, huh, I feel like we should kill that probably before it completes, you know, that that kind of stuff. So... Pulling from past experiences, I think, is really important. Um, even to the design of, like, NPC models. Uh, I know, like, when Tettles and Dratnos and I did um, Halls of Atonement the first time, you know, there's this big mob with long arms that looks like he cleaves, and it's like, I bet you this guy cleaves, and he fucking cleaved. Yeah, or you like, you whip him around, he just cleaves us, you're like, yeah, okay. <laughs> or, you know, these look like swords. These are probably going to leap. Oh, look, they leaped a bit. Like, that kind of thing. Yeah, you know, you also have this, you have this, like, glossary of old abilities as well built up if you played BFA, if you played Legion, and using that to explain to other people and to understand for yourself how something works can be really valuable. So, like, hey, you know, this is like the Cujo leap, right, where it targets, it leaps at the furthest person first, and that was like the oh, Fenrir yeah, leap, right? The Fenrir leap, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Uh, so, you know, if we see that again, that's, that's a, a glossary. A, you have all this knowledge from abilities you've already learned that you can activate and, you know, shortcut that learning process if you can make the connection to a previous ability that the game has had. And sometimes you can do this like like you're like okay you know this is like this ability but it's different in this way right like it's like a Cujo leap but it does closest person first or whatever and that uh, that can be a way to you know help you keep this keep track of these things in your mind. I also think doing the dungeons on a difficulty that you're overqualified for can give you the gist of how a dungeon works. So say you're qualified to do a Mythic Zero, you can run it on like a heroic or a normal difficulty to try to get like a little bit of experience beforehand before you go into that mythic zero or that plus two or whatever uh, to try to get just some semblance of understanding of how some of the stuff works. Of course, there yeah. are mechanical differences on heroic uh, to mythic and normal to mythic that are going to be present, but going in there and doing it on heroic or normal to try to get a, just at least a general workflow of how the dungeon is going to work can be beneficial. 
For sure. It gives you a good outline of it. I think if you kill stuff too fast, you're not going to see like what's dangerous though and how often stuff casts their spells. So I think like just knowing like how the dungeon is paced on heroic and then going to mythic zero with the expectation that you're going to have to kick or dodge more things is probably a good way to do it. Yeah. And then the people you're playing with can be big resources too. Some of them will have done the dungeon more times than you or, and they can help you learn things. So uh, that can be really useful, but this is something you have to be really careful of because my experience in like early BFA M plus just plugging around keys is that people had the wrong ideas of how stuff worked a lot. Um, yeah. People will tell you like, oh, you know, focus this mob or kick this thing or, you know, don't kick this thing and they'll be wrong <laughs> about it, right? Um, and so you need to make sure that you understand, you know, the reliability of any given piece of information based on who it's coming from, right? Like if you're just doing a random pug with people, believe what they say generally like be like okay you know that that's what i'm gonna do but like don't just if you wipe to that or if you find yourself taking a lot of damage don't just be like well the person in this pug said to not kick this so you know i don't have to kick this um even up to this day there are there are dungeons where like pug mindset about what you're supposed to do with certain interrupts is just very wrong that being let said. The, like let the hex go through if you have a double double curse to spell in your group in kr there's no reason to even kick it like just let it go through, man, and then dispel it and then kick other stuff. Yeah, so understanding those sorts of priority things, understanding, like, if you're playing a dungeon with Squishy, for instance, Squishy is going to have, like, extremely good ideas about what each of the, the things are. You know, he's like a, an encyclopedia. He's building up an encyclopedia because that's his job for how these dungeons work. And so, <laughs> he you know, hard carried me. Dude, he hard carried me through the Mythic Plus the on Thursday or whatever. I had no idea what I was doing. He's like, oh, yeah, you just run over here and do that. So I'm like, okay, yeah, I can do that. So Squishy's playing... fun to learn stuff with too. Like he'll he'll hold knowledge from you intentionally until you like see it, so you're surprised by it in most cases. And then yeah, he's an asshole lets you die to it randomly just because he wants to watch you die. <laughs> that, that only to settles, only to settles. That I, I would do that to Drados and Chell. Not that me. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> so I get I get kind of, I get kind of I got kind of carried the other day in Dungeons with Squishy. That was easy. So yeah, definitely let people carry you whenever they are capable of doing it, uh, and that that will help you also. But to, to build up that like encyclopedia or whatever Dratnos called it, uh, a, big, a big of it's just trial and error. Like you're gonna wipe when you wipe to something, figure out why you wiped. Uh, is it a debuff? Like hover over every single debuff. It's it's a lot to take in. Is this just a slow or is this a massive dot? Does this reduce my stats? Like, and then you kind of create this bank of what is important and what's not. Yeah, and it can be an overload when you first go into a dungeon, right? You're, like, when you first go into a dungeon, there's 100 new abilities. You're not going to learn all 100 of them, right? You're oh, going to yeah. learn, like, the 10 that killed you the first time. And then the next time you go into the dungeon, like, try and learn some more. And just keep doing that every time you go into the dungeon. Eventually, you'll learn what all the abilities do. But nobody's asking you to, like, learn it all on the first go-through. That's really hard. Well, it's also, like, determining what's spell reflectable. The only way you can determine what's spell reflectable for your power is you just... Try, try and reflect it. Yeah. yeah. Literally everything. Yeah. I mean, stand in random AoE. Sometimes it's reflectable. Yeah. I mean, even just stuff on the floor, just like, oh, this thing dropped on the floor next to me. I wonder if it's good. Probably not, but I want to see what it does. So I'm just going to yeah. step into it and, and then see what happens. Oh, like the, the puddles on in the plague fall. In too. plague fall, like, yeah. The, the, red, red, the red, the red puddles in plague fall, which historically red puddles are just like, you don't stand in those. But they're a very small dot, and they give you a pretty substantial haste increase. So you're like, oh shit, we stand in this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's like the um, like the bubbles from Cathedral, right? The, uh, except, the hasty bubbles. Yes. not overtuned. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, precisely. Yeah, definitely right. like mouse over your debuffs before you dispel them. Sometimes, uh, to take like one second here and there to like gather information rather than just surviving. Don't don't auto dispel sometimes too. Uh, a big part is just working with your with your group though. Like, hey, I want to see what that does. Like, can we can we let that go off? Like, yeah. what did that do to you? Like, how did you die? Like, just discussing with your group and working together to 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 figure out this dungeon as a group is the best way to do it. Just communication, teamwork. Absolutely. All right. I think that about does it for our topic here. This is something that I think we could speak for longer about. And we may do again in the future. Is it even a fuller topic when we are in a show that we have more time in? Uh, I don't want to go through our whole Q&A segment here, but I do want to do this top one to end our show. Uh, okay. So we'll do we'll do like a quick take on this, this one. So this is a tweet uh, from at Vexthor, who is quoting a tweet from now 
at our thread about what questions you have. So um, biggest winners or losers so far with the currently available legendaries and covenants in terms of like how classes feel gameplay wise. Let's each maybe give uh, give one hit here of of class or spec. That... I'll take I'll take loser. Okay, Havoc I'll take Demon the Hunter. Ooh. Havoc <laughs> Demon Hunter is by far the biggest loser moving from BFA into Shadowlands. So first and foremost, the Azurite loss from from Havoc was already like semi big in of itself. Like losing Furious Gaze makes the spec feel pretty bad because you're not pressing Blade Dance every three seconds or whatever. That felt like shit. Uh, in addition to that, that whole class is now target capped. <laughs> like, it does. I don't know if it's that it's under tuned, but that class does negative fucking damage right now, and is all target capped and feels like total shit to play. Man, I think if they don't target cap literally every class like that, most classes like Demon Hunter are currently are going to feel so bad. Because, like we said, there's so many pulls that just have way more than five targets. Yeah, I mean, you, you'll just like bring evil. the uncapped classes for the high-level keys, and it'll probably be okay in the low-level keys, but again, people are going to start getting declined from weekly 15s or whatever and not be happy about it, so um, not great Demon there. Hunter still does have Chaos Brand, though, so you need one for raid. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I have now Kib shooting me a DM. <laughs> uh, from my experience, the... And, and now's experience, I was reading his take on it. Bloody K, Brewmaster, and Prop Paladin all feel stronger and I think more fun in general with the Shadowlands build. Dude. Even without Essences it, or Corruption, I think they, they, feel, they feel more fun, honestly. Isn't Guardian Druid just god-awful right now? Yeah, I saw his log of Guardian I haven't tested Guardian Druid yet, but now played it yesterday and he did less than 1k overall in a dungeon. And on average, tanks are doing like 2 to 2.2k overall. 30% of his like... damage was auto attack as well on that spec. <laughs> yeah, which, that's, uh, cool. that's, that's just does, tuning, right? That's just tuning. Yeah. yeah. Does Bear feel okay to play at least? Because I know you've played Bear at least a little bit. I haven't done it in dungeons yet. I, okay. I need to test it. For me, a uh, big winner is Arcane Mage. Arcane Mage, so the. the um, the Lust Ring is coming back, but only for Arcane. And so if you want access to that Lust Ring as a mage, you, you're playing Arcane to get it. And uh, I'm really excited actually about playing some Arcane Venthyr, or not Venthyr, sorry, Necrolord uh, in dungeons, because you can make your Arcane Blast hit three targets, and you can line that up with every other Arcane power um, and just just blast three targets from actual orbit with that setup. Uh, and you can have a, a mini Bloodlust for like every one of those as well. So that to me is something that is really exciting to play. That was the first character I rolled up on beta since beta came out because I, I was thinking to myself, well, there's no way I could play this covenant on an actual mage because you know I'm not going to be able to play that for raid progression. So if I'm playing a mage, I'm not going to get to do this on the live servers, but I really want to try it out while I can uh, on beta for, for dungeons. For, for me, I think, unfortunately, it has to be Boomkin. Um, as one of the premier non-target capped classes, uh, the difference between double boomkin and not double boomkin when pulling a bunch of trash is pretty noticeable, especially when that trash is all casters and don't move into melee. Yeah, you can just still starfall all of them, even even in those pulls we were talking about, about yeah, needing to group stuff up. Boomkin are just like, nah, bruh, we're fine. It's, God, it's, <laughs> it's, absol it, it's, it's actually crazy that they are like they can do so much damage because they're not target capped to anything that doesn't have to be cleaved in a, in a, in a set circle. Um, so the downside of that is that you uh, you can only have one Starfall active at once, so you can't spam it. And that's that's the target cap for Balance Druid, but it is no, in no way, shape, or form the exact same as other classes. There's no fucking it's, way. Uh, it may become an issue in 9.3 when everything else is fixed with the game. To, to, me, <laughs> to me, that's not the big downside. To me, the downside is you're probably going to have to do some dungeons with Tattles next expansion, and that was something that was largely avoidable in BFA <laughs> thanks to the tuning of Moonkin, but... <laughs> Thank Maybe God, unavoidable right? <laughs> in Shadowlands. Uh, I also think another big loser is the Shadow Priest and the Marksmanship Hunter, which two are which are both overtuned classes currently. So they are making people believe that they're actually good whenever they will eventually be uh, nerfed into not being good and suck ass to play. So be be warned. All right. On that note. That is going to be the end of our show this week. Hope you've enjoyed this extra long edition. Thanks so much for being on our show again, Squishy. Hope we got to talk about everything you wanted to talk about today. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me again. It was, is it was, your, it was a ton of fun. Is your, <laughs> you invited yourself. Yeah, actually, you invited yourself, dude. 
<laughs> this, this man slides my DMs. Yo, can I come on the show tomorrow? I'm like, yeah, okay. And I don't care, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's totally fine. You can go on the show whenever you want. No, we're all just like, yes. Come Dude, on. Dude, it is so great whenever whenever Squishy DMs us and just wants to be on the show for any given episode because we just there goes all the pressure of like having to come up with content that week. We can just just, like, just slap in whatever the you know the new well, we news is. We were is. gonna do this anyways. We we're just gonna <laughs> do this without them. <laughs> um but yeah thanks is your survey thing for bfa dungeon still going is that still live uh, not uh it is not live right now it just test on patrons i have to do some other stuff with it real quick okay before, so before. at some point so, soon we'll have that out yeah there will yeah. be a survey it's going to be on wowhead i think right it will be but i'll also link you i'll ask all these guys here to yeah to we'll, we'll, right. we'll, yeah, yeah. we'll signal boost it when it comes out so stay tuned uh, for that. Basically, there's a survey. It's going to be asking what's your favorite dungeon, least favorite dungeon, why. Kind of give like a demographic uh, from BFA. Just get like a demographic representation of where you're from and like why a dungeon is your best, like favorite or least favorite. So, yeah, very interesting data to collect there. So, uh, look we'll forward to that, that soon. At some point. That oh was yeah. Fun. When we when we get those results, that'll be a topic on our show for sure. Oh yeah. All right. That's going to be all for us this week. We'll be back next week in the middle of our Mythic Plus extravaganza event for another episode of Titan Forge. Bye, everybody. See ya.